Steve Baxi. How you doing, Steve? Good. How are you doing, Cap? I'm okay. Today, we are talking about the eighth episode, I think, in the second volume of Batman Animated Series. It's Cat Scratch Fever. Oh, goody. This one is... This is... Oh, this is bad. Never mind. I've got nothing. It's, it's really bad. It's, it's just riveting, Steve. No, it, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be... It'll be fun to talk about, I'm sure. Um, yeah. This is... This is, if I'm not mistaken, one of, if not the first of the, uh, like, bad guy rehabilitation plots. Yeah, um, I don't think we've seen much of that yet. Well, like, but trying is... to integrate back into society, because when we get toward the end of this volume, oh god, there's tons of it. Nearly, I mean, just, it, it, after a while, it seems like every other episode is, like, some bad guy that got out of prison and is, or, or got out of the asylum and is trying to integrate back into society. Yeah, and other Bat shows did that, too, afterwards. Like, the Batman's got quite a few episodes where criminals are, quote-unquote, rehabilitated. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think this this is the thing that started all of that. Um, and maybe it wasn't a good idea to go with Catwoman since we've only seen her once before. Yeah, I thought that was strange too because I because I because I, I kept like like thinking back to what happened in that episode after. I mean, we'll talk about this, but you know, you know, after after the after the judge is like, but you helped save the city. I'm like, wait, did, did that happen? And then I was like trying to remember. Yeah, I mean, she wasn't <laughs> like a horrible criminal in Cat and the Claw. She helped save the day with Batman. Yeah. I don't know, it was kind of bizarre. So anyway, uh, we're going to go ahead and get into it. If you want to watch the episode with us, uh, like I said, pull up Cat Scratch Fever either on your DVDs or your Amazon, however you want to watch it, get it past all the menus, get it to timestamp zero, and get ready to press play as soon as I say now. Are you ready, Steve? Yep, I'm all set. All right, here we go. Everybody, please press play right now! Classic intro, because we need the atmosphere for this episode. Yeah, I'm pretty sure eight in a row like this, Steve, that we're just done with Netflix roulette now, right? Or not Netflix. Sorry, sorry. That, I mean, maybe not forever. Eric and I would like to bring that show back at some point. Uh, but I think, I think, I think we're kind of, we're kind of done with, uh, with intro roulette now, don't you think? Like, yeah, I'm I think pretty so. sure volume two just has this intro. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a lot more consistent than volume one was. So yeah, we think we're finished with it. I just think it's hilarious that, you kept expecting it, and then you would get really excited every time that it was this one. And I'm like, Steve, I'm pretty sure this is all you're getting. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't want to go up to a really good episode expecting this intro and then get Superman Batman. See, Steve just thinks that he has this amazing luck now. He's like, I'm going to try my hand at the craps table. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so... This is another episode written by um, Boyd Kirkland, or not uh, written by, directed by Boyd Kirkland. So it's got some really nice uh, animation cues all around, but it still doesn't look like necessarily one of the best. Um, it is one of the more cartoonier ones, especially with the, some of the faces. Yeah, like Boyd Kirkland does some really great episodes, like uh, um, uh, what's it called? It's never too late, and uh, Beware the Gray Ghost, and Almost Got Him, where all those have some really great shadow plays and stuff. Uh, and this one's got that in places, but it's a little bit more lazy. Yeah, like it's just inconsistent, right? Yeah, um, like this whole courtroom got... scene just visually doesn't look very good. I'm with you. You got you got all these people in the courtroom, and like when we see them behind Selena, they have faces. But and and they move in things, but then when, when we when we go behind them, there's just a bunch of cardboard cutouts. Yeah, no, it's really strange, and they move in really weird ways too. Like it's all exaggerated. I think it's hilarious that the first of all, this judge is so over the top. <laughs> if you ever done the Catwoman costume again, I'm like, I'm like, you're 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 not you're you're not like a, a TV preacher. What are you What are you doing? And uh, but I also think it's really funny that she's like, if you if you ever done the Catwoman costume again. To, uh, to steal things. I'm like, oh, well, that's giving her this giant out, right? Like, <laughs> I, I was really surprised that the judge is like, it's totally cool if you want to wear that to, like, a costume party or to... <laughs> I, mean, I mean, obviously, 
that would it wouldn't be illegal just to put the costume on. No. But I. <laughs> yeah, but it does two steel things. She could also very easily be a superhero now. Yeah. Well, and what's funny about that is that later on she basically is. Yeah. And and the cops aren't after her. <laughs> and and like she you know she gets in the newspaper. Well, I, I shouldn't jump the gun because this is the only thing I had to say about this whole episode. <laughs> um. But it but but anyway. No. So I. Uh, but, so as we know, Steve does not like the Batman Catwoman relationship, and especially doesn't like it in the show. Yeah. So this whole idea that uh, that Alfred's like you should go see Selena Kyle that probably doesn't track with you at all. It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't even track in the continuity of this series because the last time we saw it, I still have no idea why Bruce Wayne likes Selena Kyle. Like she's attractive, and he hung out with her once. That's their whole relationship in this show. And now they've got this so, whole weird forbidden love thing that doesn't actually come from anywhere. Do you think it's just informed by uh, just history in the comics? Yeah, where it's like, like, you, like, it's you like, get to the new Batman you know, adventures with you scratch my that. back, and they kind of play it like that. Yeah. Um, but that's a risk that you run sometimes when you're dealing with characters that are iconic and uh, and recognizable and that people have preconceived notions about, where where it's like, uh, well, they, they have a forbidden love thing because they've always had that before. Yeah, and I guess they, you've seen with these characters. they do this over over a period of time. Like she's not that, really that that box has nothing but crabs in it. Okay, <laughs> it's like a giant insane. crab box. Yes, yeah, it says crabs and like really big. I mean, I, I mean, yeah, it's on the docks. I guess I, I, but that just looked like a really big box to have nothing but crabs in. It. Anyway, I'm sorry. What? <laughs> sorry, um, <laughs> I was just saying, um, it's. And, and they do this over time. Like, by the time you get to the end of the series, she kind of becomes more or less comic book Catwoman. Um, yeah. But she's not that to begin with. Like, this Selena Kyle is extremely different from what we're what we're used to. Uh, so it makes that assumption that we're supposed to have the Forbidden Love thing, but they don't set her up that way. Like, she, she's her own character, but we're supposed to make our own assumptions about their own character. It's kind of awkward. I agree with you. That is strange. And I mean, she's, and in this episode, you know, she's, she's kind of uh, more of a crusader and an activist than anything. Yeah. I mean, she's so much more of a victim in this than anywhere else. Like she seems to care a lot more about, uh, you know, animal cruelty and stuff like that than she does about, you know, stealing things in her own bottom line and stuff. And it just doesn't seem like that same seductive kind of character. No, absolutely not. Um, and that's fine. They just have to play it more consistently. Which they Oh no, it's no, it, no, it is fine, and, and I, I kind of, I kind of like having having a slightly different take on it. Oh yeah, me um, too. And she's able to still kind of, uh, you know, you know, play that seductive side a little bit with Batman, but it's more of kind of a innocent, playful thing than it is a manipulative thing, right? Yeah, um, and they go a little bit uh, in in the more extreme innocent side when we get to Batman Beyond with uh, Ten from the Royal Flush Gang. Oh yeah, um, who's basically his who, cat. Who, who who they and they come right out and say is his Catwoman, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have Bruce allude to it. Yeah, and she doesn't show up more than a couple times, which which is kind of sad. Because uh, it would have been nice to see that uh, relationship evolve. Yeah, and I I like her at least as much, if not more, than I do Catwoman. Oh yeah, I like her a lot more than I like this Catwoman. This show. I mean, I always like this voice actress. Um, I always like the character design. Uh, like like I like I like this particular version of the Catwoman suit. Yeah, I think it looks good. Um, I always thought the uh, I always thought the the belt with the links was kind of cool. Oh yeah. Um, see, like in this scene, I don't know why she's not fighting back harder. Like it just seems so awkward. That's a really good point. She she should have that. She should have that cat taser that she has in <laughs> in Batman Returns. Oh yeah, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> um. See, like, she's just a weird, different character scene to see. Like, she was all terrified for a second, then Batman shows up, and she's back to being a uh, comic book uh, forbidden love Catwoman. It's really weird. Yeah, and and what was she scared of? I mean, you can't tell me that that Catwoman can't take out a, a, a couple of, uh, you know, animal, whatever you call it. Um. Uh, yeah, no, just saying, uh, animal poachers or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they're so cartoony too. They're like uh, four o'clock after after school special cartoon villains. Oh yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> oh, and that's Montoya. I didn't realize she was in this episode. 
I mean, they they look like they ought to be henchmen. They're they're basically Corella Deville henchmen. That's what they are. Yeah, that's exactly what they are. And see, these everything Daggett's working with is kind of cartoony too. Like I just don't, I don't understand what they were thinking of when they were making this episode. It feels so after school <laughs> special. It, well, not after school special, but just like generic Saturday morning. I mean, you watch this show to get away from this kind of stuff. Yeah, a little. <laughs> it's a little strange. <laughs> this must have been a trip watching it as a kid because I can't remember um, having this experience. But like one day you're watching. Um, um, Laughing Fish, and then the next day this episode plays, and he just doesn't feel like the same show anymore? Yeah, chalk it up to variety, Steve. <laughs> I still like that Daggett is just evil J. Jonah Jameson. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a lot of fun. Like, this scene doesn't look too bad. That That's where the weird inconsistency comes from. Like, certain scenes are shot really well, and then other ones just go back to being weirdly animated. I don't think we ever really do all that much with uh, her sidekick, Maven, either. Like, she's no, just kind of there. Yeah, she just kind of stands around and hangs out with her. Um, she's got a whole thing in the comics that we never get in, the, in any adaptation, really. Oh, really? Yeah, like, her and Selena Cow got, got, like, a much longer history in the comics um, that they don't even broach here, which is fine, um, because some of that stuff may not work out on a uh, TV series unless you do, like, full-on 40-minute drama. We are bringing up, and I guess there's a lot of that in, in, you know, in episodes like this where we bring up interesting ideas before we actually do anything with them uh but you have but you have that kind of you know, classic superhero thing with the love interest that likes one one of your personas but not the other and doesn't relate to the same person uh, but we yeah. don't really do anything we don't really do anything with that <laughs> no no we um, don't. but i do like but i do like the idea that that uh that bruce would love to date her if he can especially um especially now that uh she has gone straight and, it, like, he could, although I don't know that it, that would look good for his image, but, you know, his philanthropist, it would put whatever, but I mean, like, yeah. but, like he, he could technically get away with that, uh, but he can't date someone as Batman, uh, <laughs> because, well, first of all, that would just be impractical. I mean, <laughs> you, you're, you're not, you're not going to take a lady out for a night in the town wearing that. Um, Are you sure? But, that sounds like an awesome idea. <laughs> But may- well, maybe you would just have a different sort of evening. Like you probably, you probably wouldn't go to a five star restaurant, but you just, you know, roof jump and stuff. I guess is what you would do. <laughs> I want this but, comic. I want Batman and Catwoman in full costume sitting at a five star restaurant. Just going to a restaurant? Yeah, yeah I need this comic great. to happen. <laughs> and then Batman has to go and do his utility belt to put out and pull out his wallet, yeah. and then he has to make sure and not pay with his credit card. Because, because first of all, of course, he doesn't have a bat credit card. That's the first thing, and second, and secondly, because if he accidentally, because because he might accidentally let everyone know what his secret identity is because he gave them his credit card, <laughs> and then he accidentally shows off like three or four like really dangerous weapons while he's trying to fish around for his credit card or for his for his cash. <laughs> See, that's the problem with having a utility belt. It's good for everything except pain. Yeah. Anyway, you slice it, you know, because you don't carry any money around, then you can't pay for things if you need to. But if you carry money around and anybody gets a hint that Batman's, you know, packing a thousand dollars everywhere he goes, <laughs> then you might just have petty thefts that try to pit pocket Batman. <laughs> <laughs> or petty thieves, excuse me. There's an entire story about Batman just walking down the street wondering about uh, pickpockets. It's kind of fun. Yeah, I want to write the really mundane day-to-life Batman stories. <laughs> yeah, Batman just changing the oil on the Batmobile. Um... <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to figure out what suit to wear for that Wayne board meeting today. Yeah, it, the the... The story where the Batmobile overheats in the highway, <laughs> and he's got to call. He's got to call Alfred to send the. the see, and now I'm imagining this in one of the Arkham games. <laughs> where, where like Alfred, my my, bat, my Batmobile overheated. <laughs> the computer's not working, so he has to call customer service in the middle of Arkham City. Yeah, and then. And then <laughs> 
he called OnStar? <laughs> And then Alfred, and then Alfred sends the bat plan, and and uh, and it sends like an oil changing kit. And it's just <laughs> you have to go through this whole complex mini game to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you have to press a button to check the oil first to see just how. Well, anyway, the, the Batmobile's not gonna overheat here because it's like below zero outside. <laughs> <laughs> kind of wish it would though. So anyway, what's going on in this? <laughs> Catwoman got bit by a crazy cat, and now she's kind of sick with the whole fever thing, and Batman's going to save her, I assume. Oh, yeah, and we have to have the obligatory, uh, uh, your hotline. Yeah. Yeah, I, did, I really didn't that that. This show? <laughs> You're hot. Oh, now you notice. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it would just work so much better in a better context. Well, it also feels out of place in the show for some reason. I don't know. Like, like that kind of that kind of this is nitpicking. I realize, but that's almost too contemporary for this material. Yeah, maybe. Almost, in, at least in my brain. I don't know. Yeah, it, like it doesn't it doesn't uh, contribute to the same atmosphere. Like, as, as a as a as a phrase as a as a, as a popular you, you know you know kind of slang kind of kind of kind of phrase you're hot that's very 80s or 90s before it's timeless right yeah like yeah you're right i mean i don't know when that was popularized but uh it, it it's not a, it's not a thing that i see in a lot of like 50s and 60s movies yeah neither do i uh this shot of batman on the rooftop of the moon looks really good that looks really good yeah um and then we go back to badly animated Daggett and the dog. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a spinoff Saturday morning cartoon, Daggett <laughs> and his dog. <laughs> I'd watch that. And now we get another fun Batman interrogating somebody upside down scene. I don't know what he's this guy's afraid of. He's literally about like one foot above the ground. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, if you got a scary guy in a bat suit and you're you're all tied up with your uh, with your tie in your face, I guess I just wonder what he would do. <laughs> I guess he could use him for a punching bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> and then he like you know just comes back and then he hits him again. And, yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, that's What? Sick. A Tommy gun! <laughs> I think we're nearing the end of this episode, um, but it's a really, really slowly paced one. It really is. Like, this one feels like it takes forever to go by. Uh, again, you know, I, I, I the the central ideas, I think, are fine. I like, I like the idea that uh, Catwoman just doesn't know how to not be involved. And this could be a really good transition, even though we've only had one episode where she was doing any thieving. <laughs> this, this could be a really good transition uh, into making her more of a more of the vigilante type, and then and then maybe down the road she ha she has this conflicting thing where she's like, "Do I really want to save people, or do I want to just help myself?" Uh, but but I, but I like the idea that like as soon as because she has every intention to go straight, and I guess that, that's that's what I like about it is that yeah. this isn't one of those, this isn't one of those uh, villain plots where it's like she's everybody like 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 she gets out and she's perpetuating the idea that she's going straight, but she really has some other uh, idea up her sleeve. And I also like that it's not just go right back and steal things again. Because yeah. um, I feel like I've seen that Catwoman plot in places too, where it's like I just can't stay away from the ice. And and here, uh, it's it's uh, it's no, I, I care I care about the animals, and we've already set that up a little bit. So I mean, that's yeah, you know, that's good. I mean, I like like this is a much more literal Catwoman, where like she likes cats and she cares about animals, and and um, the the whole the whole animal rights thing uh, could be a a decent motivation for her. And I don't think it's that's laid on too thick. It seems like that's just kind of a personal cause thing for her. And I don't, I don't it doesn't it doesn't watch like a PSA or anything. Yeah, and I mean it helps that we don't have an, uh, like any kind of dramatic origin or anything for that. She's just a person that cares about animals. Um and you could have very easily made the relationship between Bruce and her work if you just kind of uh gave her more of a solid character arc throughout the show. 
No, she should have a backstory where her cat was killed in front of her, Steve. <laughs> and, and it was a big then, conspiracy to steal her company with the new mayor yeah, who works for Azri. <laughs> no, 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 no. You don't have to bring Gotham in it. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm just saying, like, 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 she gets. This is not a serious suggestion, but but her her, her cats. Uh, well, let's let's say there's two of them. Let's say her two cat her two cats get killed in front of her when she's when she's a child, and then that ends up being the big thing that she and Bruce have in common is that they both lost people very something something sentient very close to them. <laughs> yeah, mine were he and Bruce were his parents, and then Selena had two cats. Had two cats, right? See, it's like poetry, they rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. Yeah. This is a Man, pretty those... massively cartoony dog. You know what else was really weird? Uh in, in the 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 compound where they were keeping all the all the uh, animals, they had like almost only dogs and then one <laughs> like really really skinny cat. <laughs> I still don't entirely get what the purpose of this whole plot was. Like, what is Daggett trying to do with with feral animals? I'll be honest with you, this was always a plot that was difficult for me to, like, really get engaged in. Um, (laughs) I feel like I missed something, but I don't really care what. (laughs) (laughs) That's, That's it in a nutshell. Man, you know, that dog needs to learn to mind its surroundings. I, I I always like uh, how how much ingenuity and resourcefulness Batman has. Uh, that I, I think I think it's cool that they fought to animate that where like he finds a way to take a breath even though he can't get out yet. Oh yeah, that was, that was cool. Um, and then grabbing her from underneath the ice is kind of cool too. But it's it's just really inconsistent in tone, right? Where you got those really realistic moments in in this episode. Yeah. Kind of get away with anything. Yeah. Um, like, there I mean, are no like, rules for this one. Yeah. I mean, this is just... This is I've Got Batman in My Basement weird. Like... <laughs> yeah. Um... There's some kind of... Stereotypical... How men look at women stuff in this, right? Yeah, a little bit. Um, because Selena's very much a damsel in distress throughout this whole thing. And just, like, the fainty noises and all of that, yeah. like, like, you know, that, that's not, that's not lining up with the version of her that they're trying to create, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, especially when you go back to the cat and the claw, and we had that really dumb Batman line, I'm an equal opportunity crime fighter, and the whole thing was that she was trying to be, um, completely her own person. Yeah, and here, at least we don't have any of that kind of stuff. But That's I mean, true. like you know, you know, she she's a she's a strong, independent woman who uh, is going to make her own choices and can't help but but uh, you know fight the battle she feels like nobody else is going to fight. Why do we need that other stuff? Like just have her do what she's going to do. Yeah. Uh, and and don't and don't bring in the typical um, you know naive, silly. Women, how we look at women stuff. Yeah. Like, or Batman how... even gives her a cat back at the end of the day. Like, that's just a little too much. I suppose, uh, but, you know, I like that this time he doesn't have any reason to take her back in. I mean, it doesn't end the way you would have expected it to. That's fair, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I, I guess that's kind of neat. Um, and, and that... You know, there's every reason to think that, okay, at, at that point, they could get together and she, she could end up being a Batman sidekick, really, uh, <laughs> if that's all you ever had, like. <laughs> <laughs> but I always thought that was a really throwaway episode, Steve. I mean, like. Yeah, definitely. Um, you skip that one and you go to the next one, it's easy to kind of forget that. I mean, you go to the next Catwoman episode, it's easy to forget that that even exists. But like I said, with, with the with the newspaper at the end, I just think it's really funny that it's like, Batman and Catwoman, save the day! And uh, she she put on her costume again. She donned her costume again, Steve. But I guess it was for, it was for uh, you know, it, it, it was it was for good altruistic things. So no one's, no one's coming after her. Like, the only reason nobody comes after Batman 
is because it's not like vigilanteism is illegal. I mean, like the only reason nobody comes after Batman is because he's got a he, he's got a, a a cop ally on the forest that yeah. leads the forest. So <laughs> you got so like you got a picture of her in the suit and nobody's coming after her. I find that hard to believe. Yeah, that's kind of bizarre. Um, but I guess she wasn't trying to steal anything technically, so maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Well, anyway. Uh, everybody, thanks so much for watching. We sure appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed this somewhat haphazard commentary on Cat Scratch Fever. And we will see you again next week for another exciting episode of Bad Chat. Uh, next week, we are talking about... What's the next one, Steve? It's the Hugo Strange one, right? Yeah, The Strange Secret of Bruce Wayne. Oh, yes. The Strange... Yes, I forgot Strange... I just put that together. That's why <laughs> Strange is... <laughs> so, so next week, we'll be talking about that. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you then. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Steve Baxi. See you later.